right, good evening. Man, we're going to try that again. Good evening. All right. I want to welcome everyone to worship tonight. Um, it's good to be here. I'm excited. I think God's doing some cool things in people's hearts. I've been listening to the stories coming out of the Multiply class. It's so cool to see how God's moving. And we're just going to praise God tonight and dive deeper into his word. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for tonight, the opportunity to be in your house and to worship you. Father, we ask that tonight, God, whatever we're carrying around with us, whatever we're struggling with, whatever we're worried about, God, we're just going to lay it down at your feet tonight. God, we're saying, no, God, this is our time to be with you, and we're here to, to encounter you, God, to praise you, to worship you. Father, we ask that you would just show yourself strong in this place tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing our opening song.
Let's take this time to shake some hands and greet one another as we pass the peace. All right, let's continue to stand as we worship the Lord in song. Let's stand and sing.
worship the Lord in song. Let's collect our evening tithes and offerings. We're so thankful for what you're doing in this place and in this city. And God, just the favor and grace that you're pouring out every single day. And Lord, I just never want to be one of these people who take you for granted. So God, I just thank you for everything I have in my life. God, I thank you for this church family, Father, that's been through so much and has taken this journey with me in my life. God, it's amazing to think about how you orchestrated all that for each one of us to be here tonight. God, I pray that tonight, Lord, as we, as we look at the word, that God, you would just speak life into our hearts. The Lord, tonight would be a time where we just sell out to encounter you. Lord, with all of our thoughts, everything that's going on in our heart and our minds, God, that we want you to just steal those things. Lord, and let us only feel and hear and sense your presence. Lord, I ask that you pour a blessing and an anointing upon these gifts. That, God, they be used to bring glory and honor to your name and to reach this community with the message of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his precious and holy name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Suppose there was a group who set out for a fishing trip. The group was led by a guide who they trusted would lead them to like fish. This spot, plenty of fish here. He led them to water, but the group became full of excuses for why they couldn't fish. Some people came on the trip dressed the part and full of great fishing stories, but never seemed to do anything. 
Some claim they did not have the heart for fishing. I can't fish. Hooking a worm? It's just too cruel. But you know it's a rubber worm, right? Some said the work should be left to those whom were more skilled in the art of fishing. Carl, he's really good at casting. Shouldn't he be doing all the fishing? No, no, you can do it. It's really simple. Look, some claim that fishing was not their gift. Hold us hey, uh, uh, fishing's really not my thing. In fact, it scored a zero on my spiritual gifts test, so... No, we could still really use your Before help. the guide could yeah. finish, Carl interrupted him. I think I got one! Hey, great! You mind helping out with some of the others? No, it's okay. Carl was more impressed with catching fish on his own than he was in helping people out, like Greg here. I got a small problem here. My line's a little tangled up. Oh, my goodness. How in the world did that... Some of the people fishing said they just didn't have time to fish. Matt, where are you going? Oh, yeah. I, I have an appointment. Um, it's a thing that's going around. It's okay. It's okay. I, got a, I got a stick. It's doing great. It's great. Whoa. And some people, well, they just had problems. Hey, uh, my hook's caught on something. What's it caught on? If everyone did their part, imagine the fish that could be caught. All right. So, obviously, tonight we're going to be talking about catching fish. And, uh... One of the things I love to do, I love to go fishing. Uh, if you've read the Constant Contact this week, um, I kind of shared some stories of what all goes into a fishing trip. And it's not just you get up and you go, man. There's a lot of preparation that goes into it. There's a lot of things that take place in order to get to the point where you're actually ready to go fishing. And I can tell you guys that I've spent hours fishing without catching anything, right? And, and some days... Some days, though, you get that trophy fish. And, and um, if you, when you think about it in that analogy, there's some days where we're going to be out sharing the message of Jesus Christ, and we're not going to catch any fish, right? But then there's those days, man, where, where everything goes right, and hearts are ready to hear the message. And that's when we see God change people's lives. So we're going to start out looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. It says this, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to, to fish for people. Uh, at once they left their nests, their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. All right, so the very, very familiar passage. Um, I, I'm so used to it, I kind of stumbled around and says, Come follow me and I'll make you fisher of men, is probably how most of us have heard this passage. And what Jesus is saying is, like, follow me, and I'm going to teach you so much more than just going to work. And, and I want to pause for a second before I go any further and just say, every single day of our lives as Christians, our lives should be so much more than just getting up and going to work. We have a chance to impact everyone around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what being a disciple and making disciples is all about, is investing in the lives of the people around us with the right type of investment, and that's the gospel. So the first thing we discover is that, that uh, John the Baptist is in prison. Uh, if, if you look at Luke 3, 19 and 20, you can read the accounts. Basically, um, Her uh, Herod had done some things, and John, rebu John rebuked him, so he put him in jail. If you read Matthew chapter 14, we also discover that through that jailing becomes the beheading of John the Baptist. So, so pause again for a second when we were breaking this down and realize John paid a price for following Jesus, right? And that price in his life was exactly that, his life. He was beheaded for the, for the following Christ. Um, Jesus is telling this message and says the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe in the good news. And this is what's crazy is 
Jesus is just continuing on with the, the foundation that John had laid. Now John obviously talked about how there's one coming that's greater than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to untie, and all those type of things. Um, but Jesus is telling this same message. And here's the beautiful thing with the gospel. It's consistent, right? For every single person to hear and trust in the name of Jesus Christ, they have to repent and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is walking around in Galilee. He finds Peter and Andrew simply just doing their jobs, right? And this is a thing that we battle in today's culture is it seems like all the time I hear, some, I hear this phrase, I just don't want to interfere in someone else's life. Jesus interfered, all right? Jesus interfered. These guys are out at work doing their job, catching some fish, all that kind of good stuff. Jesus says, come, follow me, and I'll make you fisher of men. What I love here is Jesus is setting the tone up front. He says, look, I want you guys to follow me, but we got a job to do. And that job, we see come, we get the job description just before Jesus ascends back into heaven after the, the resurrection. And that's to go and make disciples. But he's setting the tone from the very beginning. Follow me and let's go catch some people and tell them about the gospel, the good news, and the saving grace of the Son of God. You're going to be catching people for the, for the gospel. Um, I love this. And it says they left their nets and they, and they followed him, right? And, and what Jesus has done is he said, man, come, follow me, but we got work to do. And I think we've missed that part in, for a long time in the church around the world. We like to just say, come follow Jesus, and leave it right there. Like, we forget the discipleship process. We forget the obedience part of what it means to follow Christ. But if we go right back to the very beginning, as Jesus is calling his disciples, he sets the tone for us. He continues on walking a little further. He finds James and John. Um, they do the same thing. They leave their jobs in their fathers. Again, um, a big thing, I have, I've heard this a million times in my life, they just I've heard people accuse the disciples of abandoning their family and responsibility. Look at John and James, and it says, they left their father and the boat with the hired hands. Okay, it's not like they just totally abandoned their family. Their family was still going to be taken care of through the family business, if you will. So keep that in mind. We look at this. Yeah, they, they left, but they didn't just leave and abandon uh, responsibility and things like that. So um, just keep that in mind. They followed Jesus. So what's this mean in our lives today? The first thing I talked about with John is there's a cost for following Jesus, okay? We don't understand that very well in America today because the cost is not very great for following Jesus in America, right? Um, the persecution that we get is a little maybe being made fun of. Maybe people look at us weird, whatever. Um, when I think of persecution and the cost of following Jesus... I think of those people who, by, by following Christ or being baptized, they're basically putting a target on their, on their lives in other parts of the world, okay? So understand there is, a cost to be pray, pay, pay, there is a cost to be paid for following Christ, but also realize how blessed we are here in America, okay? We are, you know, I, I know things are changing the world around us, but um, I don't think my life's in danger when I go home tonight because I'm a follower of Christ. I just don't feel that love of persecution. So know that we're blessed. Keep that in mind. But also know there is a price. All right? Um, even if we're not martyred for our faith, there's still a cost to be paid. I've talked a lot about with the teenagers, but when I got real serious with Jesus, I had to, I had to change my entire social circles because I couldn't live that life and follow Christ. That was a small price to pay, right? Um, family, there's, there's no question that there's been a little friction between me and some of my family members for following Jesus. Financial security is another thing that we might be asked to, to just give up that security blanket of all of our money and our high-paying jobs that are taking us away from God and, and doing what God calls us to do, okay? Uh, social status is a big one. Uh, and, and Jesus talks about this in Luke 9, 57 through 62, which ironically, after I read, wrote this, read this week's um, uh, Multiply book, and there the scripture isn't there too, but it says this. As they are walking along the road, a man said to him, 
I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their, their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Okay, now this is not scripture. Now, again, something I hear taught a lot is this isn't about just turning your back on your family. It's about proper priorities in our lives. Okay? Um, yeah, when Jesus calls us, that should be number one, first thing importance. Okay? Um, Jesus does not have a problem with us burying. One of the teachings I heard one time was, you know, we shouldn't have funerals because Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. That's not at all what this is saying. What Jesus is saying is like, I'm calling you. You need to follow me and let's go do this thing and, and put proper perspective in your life. Proper perspective is Jesus first, family second, everything else falls in line behind that, okay? So when we look at this, we have to, we have to make sure we don't get caught up in these crazy teachings that are out there. Basically, Jesus is saying it's not going to be comfortable, and he says, look, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And I can tell you, man, when I get home on Wednesday nights, the most exciting thought in the world is laying my head on that pillow and, and just relaxing, right? And Jesus is saying, look, it's not going to be that comfortable. You're going to be asked to get outside of your comfort zone. You know, I, I look at this and say about, about, about our family, we have to value our family, but our family cannot be more important than Christ. You know, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten hate mail when I say this, but my wife is the second most important person in my life. And, and what's cool is if your wife or your spouse is a Christian, they understand this, that it's Jesus first, then my spouse, then my kids, and then kind of everyone else falls underneath that. Perspective, priorities. And the, when he talks about putting the plow, I can't think of how many times do we put our jobs and our, our work and use that as an excuse not to serve Christ. And what Jesus is saying is like, look, man, this can't happen. Proper perspective in our lives. Proper priorities in our lives. So the first thing is there's a cost to be pray, play, bleh, paid. Excuse me. Second thing is he's calling us to action. All right. Jesus just did not say, hey, hey, Peter, man, come and hang out with me. All right? He's just like, hey, man, let's just, let's go get some sodas. Maybe we'll kick back some Starbucks or something and just kind of hang out together. In fact, Jesus said, I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. Jesus like, look, man, I'm going to teach you how to be a game changer. And, and take Peter's name out of that equation and put your own name in there. Steve, this is what Jesus is saying. He's like, Steve, I'm going to teach you to fish for men. Jesus is saying we're going, to, we're going on a journey, and the, the goal of the journey is to reach souls with the gospel. Right? And that's the coolest thing. It's like going on a journey, you're not sure how you're going to get there, but you know where you're going. I think about a, a, a few years ago, my family and I traveled down to Arizona for Christmas, and, and my wife and I are like, let's do something like just out of the norm for us, because usually she's got everything all detailed out. So we seriously went to the computer, said we're driving from this address to this address, give us a route. And we saw some really cool stuff, not going not gonna to lie, we saw some, some of the most beautiful back roads coming down mountains in the middle of winter you could ever see. And it was a cool journey, because we knew where we were going, there was an excitement of going there, we had no idea how we were going to get there. We just, we just went and trusted. And that's what God's saying to us. He's like, man, you're all on this journey to make disciples and to change the world around us. I don't know how you're going to get there and how it's going to look in your life. That's, that's the faith journey we're on. But we know the end results, man, is God's going to use us to reach people in the message of Jesus Christ. That's what the whole Great Commission's all about. That's why... I'm so excited, and Mark and so many other people are excited about the, the multiply class because God gave us one job to do, make disciples, go fishing for people, and, and man, I get excited when there's a body of believers with one mission, one focus, and that's just to go out and save souls with the message of Jesus Christ. God's empowered us, and he's chosen to use us as his messenger for this ministry. So the third thing is, Make following Jesus your only priority. You now we talked about the, the getting out of our comfort zones. We talked about uh, not letting the family be a distraction, not letting our jobs be a distraction. Proper priority in our lives. 
as Jesus called these four disciples, they had a choice to make. Any one of those four that we talked about tonight could have said, you know what, this isn't for me. Right? But they didn't. They said, you know what, I believe you're the son of God. I, I believe you're the king of kings. And I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to give you everything I got. And we're going to go on this journey together, and nothing is going to stop that. And what happens if we, just the people who attend church, man, we know, we've talked about the statistics a million times. 16% of this culture goes to church on a Sunday. 84, 86% say they're Christian, 16% go to church. What happens if just the 16% caught that vision right there that, man, nothing in this world is going to stop me from serving my God? No matter where I'm at, man. I just read an article today about a, a, a fire chief in, in uh, Georgia who was fired from his job because he wrote a Bible study curriculum and that evidently quoting the Bible was offensive to the city and they just let the guy go after 22 years. And, and I love what he said. He said, you know what? I would do it again today because that job compared to my king is nothing. And that's just, that, that, like, that's exciting, man. He's like, man, I don't care. You can take my job. You can do all these things. I'm going to serve my God. Exodus 20, verse 3, we all know the, great, the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. All right? And gods are anything that we, we get so many false gods in our lives. And, and um, I'm not talking like I don't have, we don't have like, or I don't have, maybe I'll do, I don't know. But I don't have statues in my house that I worship or anything crazy like that. But I have at times maybe put a football game a little bit more important than my discipleship. Maybe at times I've put my, my friends on a little more importance than my discipleship. Maybe at times I've, and not maybe, I know I've done all these things. I've put my family and, and kind of sacrificed my time in the word. And, and I've got to look at this and say, man, those are things that I've started to elevate above God. And I've I got to get that priority back in my life. These men could have finished their jobs. They could have stayed with their friends and family. These <laughs> could have finished plowing. Could have went and buried their own father, but they made a choice. You know, um, they, they've made choices. The four disciples in the story that I made a choice that there is nothing more important than my God and my Lord. So tonight as the praise team comes forward, I want you guys to close your eyes. I want you to just think about your own life. And are there things in your life that we're saying, you know what, I haven't, I've put these things in front of God and tonight, I, I just want to confess to God that I'm sorry. I want to repent, and I want to, I want to get this straightened out. So if you're sitting tonight, you say, you know what, I, I have, I do have things that I've put in front of God in my life. Why don't you just slip your hand up in the air so I can pray with you. And again, this is between you and God. Maybe you're saying, maybe you're saying, you know, my job has become more important than my, my relationship with Christ. Maybe it's, maybe it's our reputation or our friends Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's our, 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 like I said, our reputation, our social status. But tonight, if you're sitting here saying, you know what, I've done these things, and God, I'm sorry, and I want to I wanna repent, and I want to turn away from these, just lift your hand up, and I'm going to pray with you in just a second here. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time tonight, or the time to share your word and to, to dig into your word and Lord, I ask that tonight for my brothers and sisters who have their hands in the air, that God, right now they're crying out to you. They're saying, God, I'm sorry. I've let these things creep into my life. Lord, it wasn't intentional, and I just, I lay it down, and I repent of it. And God, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. Lord, we're crying out, saying, God, make yourself the only priority in our lives. Lord, use us to go catch people for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. God, use us. Well, that's what we're crying out, God, is we just want to serve you with our whole heart. And Father, for, especially for my brothers and sisters with their hands up right now, God, I pray that you give them the strength to turn from these things. God, you give them the wisdom on how to make the adjustments in their lives. Father, you would encourage them, Lord, as they take this step. Because, God, I, I know when people can sell out to you that Satan's working too. So God, encourage them, strengthen them right now. Lord, they're going to they're gonna change 
their priorities in their lives. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will receive all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Let's stand and sing one more song. Father God, thank you for this time tonight. Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Lord, thank you for calling each one of us to be game changers. And Father, I pray that as we leave this place tonight, you will use us to be a light to this world. In Jesus' name we pray.